So on March 20th, 2010, the UNBC men's basketball team claimed the CCAA national championship. That's more than 10 years ago. We got some of those special members of the UNBC national championship squad with us here today. Pretty special to have everybody. Guys, just go ahead and introduce yourselves and tell us where you're calling from. I'm Dennis Stark. I'm still in Prince George. Uh, my name is Matt Mills. I'm calling from Abbotsford. I'm Francis, calling from Victoria. I am Sam, calling from Victoria as well. I'm in the rear and I'm speaking from Spokane, Washington. My name is Kenny Carnes. I'm still in Prince George as well. I'm Daniel Stark and I'm PG as well. Perfect. So a cool little reunion. You guys have all sort of got reacquainted. When was the last time uh, you were all together? Been a while. What's the go? March 22nd, 2010. <laughs> 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 So it's been a while. It's been nearly a decade, probably. probably, since you guys have all been together. An honor to have you guys all back with us, of course. Uh, first thing that stands out to me, I did a little bit of preparation for this, is the roster. When I look over it, I see guys from uh, the Okanagan. I see guys from the Lower Mainland, from Prince George, and from all over the world. Uh, maybe we'll ask Sam this one. Sam, what about this group? Talk about the makeup and how guys kind of came from all over the place to put together this, uh, this special team. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was pretty cool to have everybody uh, mixed from from the, uh, the the homegrown guys and people from out of town kind of come together, and and we all formed a bond pretty quickly, which I think helped us to to achieve success, uh, the success that we did. Um, and it's always nice to kind of get back together with everybody, but it was definitely a special group. People forget that the year before this, the the national championship where the banner hangs proudly on the wall, you guys actually hosted the nationals at the sports center in 08, 09. Uh, let's go with Inderbeer. You were on that 08, 09 team. What was that like playing in Prince George at the sports center in front of that, that crowd? Oh man, it was great. You know, it was a, my first time being in Canada and I, I really didn't know anything to expect. So we were kind of going in, we were playing the number one team ranked in the country, our first game. I remember we had a shot to win the game, but we lost. I, mean, I missed it. <laughs> so we, uh, anyways, we, I think we had a great run that year. You know, um, we yeah. ended up getting fourth, which was a great accomplishment for our team. Because, like you said before, all of our players came from. I think that was our first year, just everybody coming in together, uh, with a new head coach as well. So I think we did great. But I think that's what really set the foundation for the championship team next year. Yeah, 08, 09, going into 2009, 2010, you guys lose some some good players. You lose, uh, I think Paul Burkholder was one of the guys that moved on at that point. Uh, Swaroop, Jarrett Borsoy, some really key contributors. But in comes this new group as well. Uh, Kevin Madsen, you got Kenny, you got Sebastian, you got Jose. Uh, maybe we'll ask Dennis this as a holdover. Uh, talk about the changes with that group leaving and that new group of guys coming in. Yeah, of course. I also think it's notable that um, Indiebra mentioned a brand new head coach. Part of that team that went on to win nationals was partly built by the previous head coach, Zane Robison. So I think that's pretty impressive as well. And then Mike Rainbow came in and took what Zane had sort of started and brought in some more recruits to, to put together the team that we went, went forward with. And um, I actually forget what you asked. I'm talking about losing some of those guys from the 0809 team and then you're getting a whole bunch of uh, other fellows into the roster. Yeah, absolutely. Um, those folks were laying the foundation as well and they're battling in practice just the same way we were before, but they moved on to other opportunities and made different decisions with how they would go on with sport. But the team that, the team that continued learned a lot from them and many of those guys that, that left the program supported us and watched us from afar. And that first year where we hosted nationals and of course when we, raised the banner in our gym the year after was uh was good and that's part of what's special about the program folks come and go but they're a timberwolf for life obviously just one ball to go around uh but a ton of talent on the roster matt maybe i'll ask you this one what were were practices like in the early going competition for playing time a competition for looks what was that like or did it all seem pretty seamless uh yeah i mean we we seemed to have a pretty good chemistry uh fairly early on and that's one thing i noticed um in that 08, 09 season is we all came together pretty well. Um, but that being said, comp, uh, practices were very, very competitive. Um, I mean, we, we went at each other and guys were competing in practices, the wind drills and to, you know, for playing time and all of that. But um, in the end, we, we had such a good chemistry that started in that 08, 09 season and then, and then kind of peaked in uh, 2009, 2010 when we won. So um, yeah, we were very competitive, pushed each other, but, all towards a common goal 
I've seen that fire in you uh, when you came back for Indi uh, excuse me for alumni weekend and you were uh, as competitive as ever, Matt Mills, famously. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll ask you this one, Dan. That was your first uh, year on the team. You were a redshirt freshman, I believe, that season. Um, but you grew up watching UNBC, I'm sure, as a, as a Kelly Road guy. Uh, how early did you realize that you had joined a, a, pretty, a pretty great team? Well, I, <clears throat> I watched the actual the season before from the stands. And uh, I already kind of knew what the team was building towards. And you could see that it wasn't, you know, if, if I ever took it for granted, there was, there was no chance to do it now. I mean, the team was, was moving quickly and you had to come in and be ready to play. Um, but, yeah, I, I remember I have a little story of, of watching the team play and, and picking up the players from the stands that I thought that I was going to relate to. And, and the two players that I told – my brother that I was, I knew I was going to be close with was going to be Matt Mills and Francis Rowe. And, uh, and then over the years we became friends, but um, yeah, coming in, you knew it was special. And uh, you, I knew that, you know, coming in as a red shirt, you had to, you had to work hard or else, you know, you're going to get left behind. Kenny, don't look so comfortable there. I'm going to put you on the hot seat real quick. I talked to Todd Jordan uh, earlier today and said I was doing this and he thought, that that 2009-2010 team had some of the greatest shooters in the history of UNBC basketball, which is now nearly 25 years old. Uh, you played with these guys, and you've seen a lot of guys come and go since at Timberwolves games. Who do you think, hot seat, is the best shooter in UNBC history? I thought you might put you on the hot seat here. Uh, I would have to say Jose. Oh, the guy who's not on the call. <laughs> yeah, the, that guy, like, you give him the ball and tell him that you need a three, that that guy is going to score. Like, uh, every time he released the ball, uh, I think Abdu and I were on our feet, like uh, three, three signs up. Uh, but yeah, uh, but anyone, like this was obviously the best team in the country. And Matt Hill, Tim Newbeer, anyone would be lights out with, once with the ball if they got hot. So got to find the right person that was on fire that night. Yeah, I see a few guys shifting around, either in anger or nerves. Uh, Matt Mills trying to bite his tongue. Francis, <laughs> if you want to weigh in. I did a social media poll, Francis, recently, the best shooter in UNBC history, and you got the most votes of the guys that weren't in the, up in the last couple of years. So uh, the, the rumors are you could shoot it. Yeah, one upon a time, maybe. <laughs> classic so let's move on to the nationals uh game one you're the number one seed in the country you're taking on i believe fanshaw the number eight seed and they give you guys some problems uh interview anybody uh what do you guys remember about that game um yeah well you know we started off really slow in that game right uh, we were down by 15 or so in the third quarter and uh, i remember like I, not at one single point in that game, I thought we were going to lose. Um, you know, and once I think, you know, we're talking about our great shooters on the team. Um, just side note, just a, I think we had four shooters shooting higher than 40% in that wow. year, which is, I think, kind of, you know, unheard of. But our sh uh, three-point shooting brought us back in the game. Jose hit us some big, uh, Jose hit some big shots. Uh, Maddie, Francis, and, uh, you know, just the whole team chemistry was so good that we never thought we were going to lose. And the fourth quarter comeback was the one to remember, you know, down 15 or 16 or whatever. I think we ended up winning by 10 or 12. Yeah. Weren't we down 15 with like four minutes to go? Or maybe it was the fourth quarter. Like that. <laughs> I, that, I thought that's what I remember. That's what I thought anyway. We were down like 15, with four minutes to go, and it was just a mad comeback the last couple of minutes. So coming off that 08-09 um, run where you finished fourth and then nearly losing in game one, quite honestly – uh, Coach Mike Rainbow, who was messenger, or mentioned earlier, what was his message at this point? Maybe, Francis, you let us know. What, what did Rainbow say after that game, knowing you guys had two more games to go? I'm not sure I remember at this point. Um, what was his coaching style? I mean, what, why, why was he the guy for this group, you think? I think, he, I think he probably just came into the locker room after and breathed a sigh of relief and told everybody to forget about that one and move along. Um, and that was really his, um, I think his, his gift was being able to manage a, a group of guys um, and sort of through the ups and downs. And um, he probably wasn't very tense with about four minutes to go down 15, just sort of loose, everybody stay, stay focused. Um, and then when you have a big comeback like that, he'd have been pumped, but it would have lasted not long. And then he would have been back to let's focus on next one. He was 
I think, really good at that. We have a special email question from a fan. Katie D from Pender Island writes in and asks about a sock superstition. I don't know what this is. She says something about a team superstition to do with socks, changing or not changing socks. Anybody want to weigh in? Is this true? She's Anybody? making this up? <laughs> we'll have to talk to Sorry, Katie Dandino about question? it. Who no, was the question from? From Katie Dandino. She thought that you guys didn't change your socks. <laughs> Well, uh, well, I definitely changed my socks. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like the responsible thing to do. So, <laughs> so whatever Rainbow said obviously seemed to work uh, between game one and game two because you guys went kind of crazy from there. I think you won by 20 or 25 in the second round, and then you found yourselves in the final against State at their home gym in the final. Uh, let's maybe ask Sam. How, were you, how sure were you guys at this point? Were you on a bit of a roll? I mean, how sure were you? playing in State's home gym that you're going to take this championship home? I think we felt pretty good after the second round game, um, beating, was it St. FX? St. Vincent. St. Vincent, thank you. Um, and that was pretty convincing. Uh, so that one felt pretty good. But I do remember in that game, it was pretty close early on, and one of their players missed like a really big putback dunk. And I feel like at that point, it was kind of going back and forth. Um, but after that miss, we kind of exhaled. And I think from that point forward, we kind of took control. Um, but I think we felt good going in. Um, yeah, once we shook off that first game, Russ, we felt good. So I want to give you guys the floor here, the championship game. Any plays that stick out to you? I mean, I've seen the YouTube highlights, but anything that sticks out from that game against Sate in their home gym? In the beer. Um, I'll okay. Go ahead, Matt. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say. I remember. I think in the beer. Didn't you have a buzzer beater at the end of the first quarter? From yeah, yeah, uh, thirty-five yeah. feet or something. <laughs> yeah, it was an ugly looking shot, man. It went in <laughs> one of my two threes in that in the in the nationals. But I remember in the in the championship game, Francis was on uh trans. Francis was in transition, and he had a wide open layup. But he pulled up like uh, Timo Cruz and uh, Coach Carter and pulled up and just started screaming after hitting the shot. And that just showed so much confidence. And I think at that point, we knew like the game was in our, you know, like the confidence was at such a high level. Yeah. At that point, I think everybody knew that, you know, what, we're going to win this thing. Something I remember from the game was that uh, both during the tournament, but also leading up to that national tournament, we had played in that gym quite a bit. We'd done the the holiday tournament at SAIT as well. They'd hosted us for a tournament over the break and then going in there with nationals. I think we had 500 people from Prince George and, and, and anyone else that supported the Teagles come to the gym. So what I really remember is that it felt like our gym. It was a uh, SAIT's tournament. They were the host and they had made the finals as the eighth seed um, or the seventh seed, I guess they moved up to, but it felt like our gym. So I remember that, the sea of yellow in the stands. Mm -hmm. I agree. Anyone else remember anything? Speaking of that confidence, because I, I was on the bench the whole time, you know, doing my thing. And <laughs> um, I just remember, like, Rainbow calling timeouts and basically saying, like, this is the last game of the season. You guys know what you're doing. There's nothing. Like, I'm not here to tell you anything. Just to grab water, take rest, get back out there, and continue doing what you're doing. So I remember thinking, like, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't a ton of uh, – correcting anything there wasn't a ton of adjustments it was just like you guys are ready for this go do it Kenny how fun is it being on a team like that where you look around and there's so many guys out there that are have been there and, and been in that situation and aren't intimidated by that moment pretty great uh, it's always fun celebrating a, a win uh, it's hard to keep track of how many wins there was and luckily it's now engraved on our ring so you can always remember yeah, it was a 96-63 game, a 33-point win for the national title. That's not even close. Uh, Matt, maybe I'll ask you this. We all picture making that buzzer beater to win it. Is it better to win a national title game by 33 or better to win it by one, do you think? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if it matters <laughs> in the end. Um, but the 33-point the win was a little bit more comfortable, I'll say that, you know, in the fourth quarter. Um, not, that, not that it's ever over till the buzzer sounds, but um, – I don't know. I mean, with five minutes to go, knowing you're going to win the national championship isn't bad. Winning at the buzzer wouldn't be bad either. I don't know. In the end, it's still a championship. Uh, who was on the court um, at the end of the game? Does anyone remember? 
everyone. No, I don't mean after. Yeah, but like <laughs> when. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's a good answer. Dumb question. Uh, let me just read this. Uh, Interview decent 2009, 2010 for you. Uh, team MVP, academic all Canadian, provincial first team all star, provincial player of the year, provincial tournament MVP, provincial champion, national all Canadian, national tournament MVP, national champion, and national male athlete of the year. I think you're too humble to probably uh, make comments about that. So maybe I'll ask the guys around you that played with you. Uh, that's one year's accomplishments. What made uh, number 12 in, in yellow and green so good? Oh, Dennis, yeah, Dennis would like to speak. Well, I, I just want to say that um, we all probably know about the Netflix ESPN documentary, The Last Dance, that's out right now, chronicling uh, Jordan and the Bulls 97-98 run. And um, I was telling my fiance Rhea last night that uh, the, only other, the, the only guy I've witnessed that I think has that level of um, intensity and drive and work ethic um, in a room of guys right now who have a ton of work ethic, I think, uh, was Interbeer Gill. And uh, the accolades follow people like that. So um, it's been, it's been uh, awesome being able to look back and have those experiences with the whole squad, but with Interbeer as our, our team captain. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that, bro. I was thinking the same thing watching it, Dennis. I was like that. <laughs> a lot of those traits that Jordan showed, Interbeer had those, um, just pushing us in practice and being the ultimate competitor. So, and that's obviously, you know, he's very talented. He's a very good athlete. And, uh, but to have that drive and that work ethic, determination every single day, whether it's lifting, whether it's shooting, whether it's in practice, he, he had it for sure. Well, Matty, I still couldn't dunk like you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not quite, but. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I remember we would try for like hours trying to dunk on that thing. <laughs> but I could never get it. Uh, what yeah. happens? I mean, it seems like you guys, you mentioned you all haven't been together in 10 years, but what, what sort of bond does it create when, when you win a game like this or you, win a, you go through a season like this and, and it culminates with a, with a national banner? Anyone can answer that. Well, I think when well, you go, I, oh, go ahead, Andrew. Um, well, I think it's just like the, you know, the brotherhood, you know, I, I think even when, since we're talking about the last sense, they talk about how much time you spend with each other. And from 2008, 2009 season, like our core group and you know, then adding, you know, Dan and, uh, you know, Jose and uh, Kevin and Seb and these guys, it just kind of added to the fire, you know, our chemistry grew. And when you put in so much work and practice together and, you know, we were so competitive in practices you obviously want to win the ultimate thing, which is the championship. It just kind of cements everything together, right? And I think that's one thing you can never take away because no matter where you go in the world, that is that one night, the championship, you I mean, you think about that, but you think more about the season and all the practices and the bond that you build over the years. It's been 10 years. Does that seem crazy looking back? I mean, crazy. a decade's sorry, gone sorry. by. Yeah. yeah, no, go ahead. What about you, Francis? Oh, I was, just, I was going to say that, um, yeah, you almost, you almost become more like family at that point. Um, and it's, you know, it's time goes by between when you see everybody. I mean, like I said, it's been a long time since we're all together. But it's also been a long time since I've seen a bunch of the individuals. Um, but, you know, you get in a room and you just pick up where you left off. You, know, you create such a bond when you spend that much time together. I know that uh, Sam has to go pretty quick, so we'll go quickly down the, the stretch here. Uh, I know we see Dennis and Kenny and Dan at the sports center seeing games. How much do you guys keep track of the T-Wolves still? I mean, how much are you keeping track of their progress and guys on their team and just maybe thoughts on some of that? We'll ask the guys from out of town uh, to, to chime in there. Yeah, I followed, a, followed along this year a um, fair bit. Um, saw Tyrell Lang had just an unbelievable season. Um, one improvement for that guy. Um, but yeah, it's good to, uh, to keep up with the guys and, and, uh, yeah, follow along. Is there a sense of pride? I mean, do you, I mean, they're playing a different league than you guys were in. These guys were children when you guys were playing quite honestly. Uh, but is there still pride when you, when you see, like you mentioned Tyrell or some of these other guys do the things they're doing in the same jersey you guys wore? Maybe we'll ask, uh, we'll ask Sammy that. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, Tyrell is somebody that I would play with at the Y with, with his dad, Norm, uh, yeah. and then coach him with PGSS and stuff. So it was really cool to see see how far he'd grown. And yeah, of course, it's always a good sense of pride. And it's nice to follow everybody on 
you know, the Instagram and stuff too. So it's really fun. Okay, we'll go to some rapid fire questions. You guys can all kind of chime in. We'll sort it out. Uh, some opinion questions here. Uh, tell me who you think the best defender on the national championship team was. Best defender. I'd probably say Sam. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good choice. That's, can't go wrong with Sam. What makes Sam a year, good defender? Why, why was he a good de defender? He's a beast. Most, <laughs> he's strong. He's athletic. He's quick. You know, he's got good size for a guard. Um, you know, and more, 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 uh, more, more than that, you know, he's got a lot of heart. So he was always a you know, tough guy to get past in practices. So I can surely say that, you know, for uh, other teams, it's got to be a pain in the butt. I'll ask uh, Dennis this next one. Uh, give me an unsung hero of this team. I mean, the guy that maybe doesn't get mentioned when you list off right off the bat the national championship squad. But what guy didn't get enough love but was maybe crucial to, to the success of this program? Well, the, the person I'm going to say is for a couple of reasons. One, he was a, a forward like me, and we did a lot of battle in practice and a lot of discussions on the bus ride home from games. But Jesse Smith, big bun. Mm -hmm. I big think bun. that uh, – he was someone who was super intelligent, really hard worker, took care of business in the classroom uh, and, and, and pushed the bigs uh, to be better and did everything coach asked within the system and uh, could, could, could stretch the floor a little bit with his pull-up threes. <laughs> what was the best game you guys played that year? Is any game stand out? I mean, you win the national championship by 30. So is there a game that stands out maybe throughout the season that, was, that you look to like, oh, that was a moment or that was the game that, that sticks out? The game against uh, the provincial final against VIU in their gym, we were down, I don't know, 18, 20, I don't know, in the second half, then came roaring back, beat them by almost 20 or something, 15, something like that. So that was, that was probably the, you had to pick one game for me, that's probably the game. Yeah, when you got four guys shooting over 40% from three, you can make up those deficits a little quicker than some of the other programs, I suppose. Yeah, that was a big one. That fan shot game one was was massive too. Yeah, um, based, you know, the the final score, the box score, as well as you know the the timeouts and how how we handled halftime, I think was really special. We were we were super calm at halftime, down twenty six, I believe. Hmm. How do you stop from getting defeated in those moments? Down twenty six, a lot of teams fold probably. Uh, how, how what what was the biggest reason that that didn't happen? I think it goes back to the chemistry and kind of working hard together and building trust throughout throughout, uh, throughout our practices. And we had actually, unfortunately, been in that situation a bunch of times throughout the year. So it yeah. wasn't unfamiliar to us as we got into the to the national final. Right. Yeah, I think the culture of practice that Coach Rainbow and uh, our, our veteran players and leaders had established was that we were going to practice harder than any of our opponents would play against us. So if we found ourselves in a deficit, it was usually because of something we weren't doing. And we, we could just look each other in the eyes and ask that quick question, like, are we proud of how we're playing? Are we playing the way we need to play? And if the answer was no, then we'd go back out there and fix that and, and, and turn those deficits into, into runs to retake the lead. Little trivia, okay. Of all the guys on the 2009-2010 team, Ender Beers hits the highest in career assists. But who is second in career assists? Of any guy that was on the 2009-2010 team, who is second in career assists? Joel. Oh, right off. Yeah. Like, interview nails <laughs> three seconds yeah. in. Yeah. yeah. Joel is correct. Joel Rybachuk, that guy put up some impressive assist numbers, especially in the last couple of years of his uh, career. Maybe, what was Joel like as a player? A bunch of good guards on this, on this uh, call right now. He was tough. He, really he, tough. he was really tough to go at in practice. He could defend. Hey, buddy. Um, he could defend. He... Uh, he could he could score he could score on anybody he was he was really tough here's another he opinion really, on, oh sorry all right go ahead dennis was, joel was really creative and um i think that you know also also came out in his humor he's one of the funniest guys on the team and fun loving guys on the team and so a real joy to play with in the pick and roll or in transition or you know when defensive sets break down he'd, he'd find a way to, to get it done through his creativity and intelligence it sounds like we're getting a visit from the next generation of Timberwolf right now. So that's. I'll, I'll say hi. Theo, yeah, you want to say you. hi? What up, Theo? 
Where did he go get his hair from? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> That's Junior Matt for sure. That's the class of 2035 or something right there. Yeah. yeah I'm surprised he doesn't have any uh, Vince Carter clothes on, man. <laughs> Sometimes he does. <laughs> He's got a little Kyle Lowry jersey. <laughs> Okay, uh, another opinion one. There's only a couple more here, guys. Uh, who's the best guy on the team at taking that tough charge of the big time? Who's, you mentioned Kyle Lowry, so it's an interesting segue. But who's the guy that when you need it most is going to step in the lane, take a body, and, and do what it took to, to get that ball back? I guess he was pretty good at that. I guess he finally got in the lane. I think Sam might have taken the most charges. That's what I was thinking, too. Yeah. Yeah. But Jesse's a good choice as well. Sam and Jesse were both stepping in. Very good. Um, this is a more of a funny opinion one, hopefully. Who was the worst practice player? Who was the guy that was uh, hilariously and historically bad? No. Couldn't get it together and drill. Yeah. The drill killer, as no. we call it in hockey. 2008 season, it was Henry by far. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting Matt, collateral. One more layer. Yeah, one one more layer. Impersonation, Matt. You got to do his impersonation. <laughs> 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 oh, I don't. I haven't done it in ten years. Uh, I will don't. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Henry, not even a part of this team, and I he's taking don't. damage. Oh, <laughs> 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 okay, and lastly, uh, we'll just go around the horn real quick here. Um, the best thing about being a Timberwolf. Maybe we'll go the same direction we set our intros. Dennis, you can start. Best thing about being a Timberwolf, starting with Mr. Timberwolf. <laughs> It's, it, it, it's a special program. Um, relatively young, being part of a relatively young university, but incredible culture. Um, and that's, 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 that's kind of indicative of the region and the city as well. Just a great community on the team. So lucky to have been a part. Matt, best thing about being a, a T-Wolf? Oh, um, well, the fan support and um, the community support and the teammates and yeah, it's just, you feel, I mean, you feel a, a real bond and a connection with the guys that you played with and guys that came before you and after you. So um, yeah, that's probably what comes to mind for me. Mr. Rowe. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the, the fan, but mostly the community support um, being a, a sort of a focal point in the community was, um, yeah, it was just incredible. In the beer. Uh, man, for me, you know, coming from a different country, I just it felt like family to me. You know, uh, the guys like guys like Dennis, who were PG guys, really treated me like uh, one of their own. And uh, you know, it, it does also help when there's a huge Indian community, <laughs> and uh, it feels like a small India in there. But uh, but like I said again, it just felt like family. Sammy. Yeah, the community and family aspect of it all. Um, it's just really special to be able to get on get on a Zoom chat like this and, and kind of shoot the crap with everybody. It's really great. And the fans, of course. And the fans, of course. Kenny Carnes. Yeah, I think Indy Beer nailed it, um, especially like most of us came from the lower mainland or even further south in the States. And as soon as we started practicing, battling it out, uh, yeah, we just started bonding on and off the court. I think uh, we had a lot of fun off the court as well as on. And um, yeah, like most of the guys on the call, I still keep in touch with here and um, when you continue on, I was like, still gone. So um, yeah, I always look back on those years uh, as a family and ups and downs for sure. And Daniel Stark. I think because the school's so young, um, they're always on the cusp of a new milestone. It seems like almost every season where it's like, you know, no matter what year you're coming into the program, there's you're right there for the next level and you're right there for the next level the next season and and you can really see the progression over the years so when you come in for five years you might be a part of you know some some crazy years for the city and for the school and for the program like it hasn't plateaued and it hasn't you know it hasn't stopped evolving so it's it's that there's always more to be achieved and it seems like they're right there every year you say five years, Dan, but we all know that you played um, eight or nine years for <laughs> UMBC. <laughs> Saw a lot lucky. of things. I got lucky. I mean, it's 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 pretty incredible that my first year was the national championship year, and then my my last year was a was a playoff win year in in the, the U Sport League. So, yeah, it's it's sort of 
so lucky the timing that I kind of came into it all. Well, we'll leave it at that. I know you guys have to go. I don't want to take too much of your time. I want to thank you guys for coming on today. And uh, thanks for everything you guys have given to UNBC. I know the banner hangs proudly on the wall and the guys now look at it uh, every day in practice and at games. And um, you guys are talked about on a daily basis around here. So uh, congrats. Thank you. And 10 years. We'll, we'll do it again in 10 more to talk about uh, 20 years ago. Thank you, Rich, for everything you do for the program, man. Yeah, no worries, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Rich. Yeah, thanks, All right, Rich. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Thanks,